This video today is being sponsored by Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN service that makes online privacy easy for everyone. Whether you're looking to keep your business safe or just your personal internet digital life, Surfshark has got you covered. Their service hides your IP address and encrypts all internet traffic coming to and from your devices. And what I like best is that it protects you from targeted ads. So all those annoying ads and banners you get that seem like someone is reading your mind or listening to your conversations will no longer get you when you use Surfshark. In this digital age, we all have to be safer with how we use the web. The internet knows a lot about us, and that's why I use Surfshark to protect myself whenever I'm shopping online, traveling, and browsing social media. They're giving an insane 83% off to my viewers, plus an extra month for free using the promo code SCARY. Check out the link in the description below and get 83% off your order with the promo code SCARY. Four horrific killers you've never heard about. You might know of the Ted Bundys and John Wayne Gacy's of the world, but there are some killers, equally ruthless, you might not have ever heard of. These are four horrific killers you've never heard about. Number four, Vlado Tineski. In 2005, a local woman, Miltra Siljanovska from Kisovo, Macedonia, was reported missing. When her body was found, it was revealed she had been raped, beaten, then strangled with a phone cord. Her body was dismembered, wrapped in a plastic bag, then placed in a dump in Kisovo. As luck would have it, it was freelance crime reporter Vlado Tineski's hometown. Tineski wrote an impressive story about the murder, wowing readers with detail and information. Then in 2007, 56-year-old Jubika Lachaska went missing. Her body was discovered in the same state as the previous victim. She was dismembered, covered in a plastic bag, then dumped in another garbage dump within the city. Months later, on May 16th, another missing woman was found. She was 65-year-old Zivana Temelkoska. This latest victim was also beaten, raped, then stabbed in the head 13 times. Another woman also disappeared in 2003, a 78-year-old who is believed to have been killed by the same killer since she fit the profile. However, her body has never been found. As the murders happened, Tineski's reporting became a favorite for many readers. He seemed to offer great information and insight on the crimes. In his writings, he called out local police, stating they had chosen illogical suspects. In one article, he also speculated on how the killer lured the victims. His writing eventually gained traction and a solid readership, but it also caught the attention of the police. They were becoming suspicious of how Tineski knew so much of the crimes. In fact, at one point, he detailed in his article how the victim was strangled with a phone cord when this detail had not yet been revealed by police at all. At first, authorities thought Tineski may have information on who the killer was. Based on this suspicion, Tineski was arrested. He was questioned and his DNA compared to those found on the victims, and to their surprise, his DNA matched. None of his co-workers could believe he was capable of killing and was described as quiet and gentle by his wife of 31 years. Police searched his home and discovered that he was leading a double life. His home was filled with pornography and countless notes about the crimes. There were also ropes and cords matching those on the victims, as well as personal items from the victims themselves. Tineski was charged with two murders and police prepared to charge him with the third one. The day after he was arrested, though, Tineski was found dead in his shared jail cell. It's believed he committed suicide by drowning himself in a bucket of water. While many think that he committed and then wrote about his murders, a lot of people doubt the suicide story. Nevertheless, Tineski's motives behind the crimes was never uncovered. It's believed it was linked towards his anger with his mother since all of the victims were cleaners, the same profession as his mother, and even bore a striking resemblance to her. Number 3. Arthur Shawcross It all began with a criminal streak of arson. 
Born in Maine in 1945, Arthur Shawcross grew up in a bad family situation. According to him, he was molested by his aunt at 9 years old, experimented with homosexuality and bestiality by 11, and had sexual relations with his sister in high school. Later, he joined the army and claimed to have seen combat in Vietnam when, in truth, he didn't. He later married twice, and it was his second wife who said Shawcross had a panache for starting fires and derived sexual enjoyment from it. After leaving the army, he and his wife moved from Oklahoma to New York, but the two would soon divorce. Shortly after, Shawcross began committing robberies, arson, and burglaries. His crime earned him a five-year sentence in two correctional facilities, but he was released after serving only 22 months in prison. He then moved to Watertown, New York, and married a third time. On May 7, 1972, he abducted, raped, and killed 10-year-old Jack Owen Blake. The young boy's body wasn't found until September 5th, but before it was discovered, Shawcross had another victim, 8-year-old Karen Hill. The little girl was visiting Watertown for Labor Day weekend when she was abducted, raped, and killed. The two crimes led back to Shawcross and he was arrested and charged for them. He pleaded guilty to the lesser sentence of first-degree manslaughter with a maximum of 25 years. He served only 15 of those and in April of 1987, he was released from prison and deemed by inexperienced prison staff as no longer dangerous despite warnings from psychiatrists. He moved across several towns in New York because his presence in the area was always met with hostility before settling in Rochester. However, his parole officer failed to inform Rochester authorities about this move. In March of 88, Shawcross began his murderous spree once again. He targeted prostitutes. The first victim was 27-year-old Dorothy Blackburn. Her body was found on the Genesee River. Blackburn was viciously attacked with various bite marks on her privates, and she was strangled. The following year, September of 1989, another body of a prostitute was found. Anna Stephan died of strangulation, and her body was dumped like the previous victim. But police didn't think the crimes were related because of differences in the modus operandi. In October of 1989, back-to-back bodies of prostitutes were then discovered. Dorothy Keeler and Patricia Ives were both found strangled, then dumped. The press caught wind of this and dubbed the offender as the Genesee River Killer after his favorite dumping ground. Then June Stott's body was discovered. She wasn't a prostitute, but her body was mutilated after death. She was gutted and had parts of her privates removed. FBI profilers knew the killer likely had a criminal or military record. They also said he was now comfortable with corpses and might return to the scene of the crime to relive the attack. Police also got a tip from local sex workers that a regular client, Mitch or Mike, had a violent tendency, although police didn't have the man's identity. In December of 1989, police found a pair of discarded jeans near the river with an ID card belonging to Felicia Steffens. Police searched by air and found a naked female body on the icy river surface. It wasn't the body of Felicia, but of another victim, June Cicero. Importantly, while the search was ongoing, they saw a man standing on a bridge next to a small van. He looked to be urinating or masturbating. The man fled the area, but the van was later tracked down to Clara Neal, Arthur Shawcross's then-girlfriend. Shawcross was found, and when officers asked for his license, he said he didn't have one. He then admitted he had been in jail for manslaughter. During questioning, police discovered his once sealed criminal past and his military service. Local prostitutes also confirmed that this was Mitch. Shawcross first denied involvement in the killings, and police initially couldn't find any evidence linking him to the crimes until they discovered a piece of jewelry he gave to his girlfriend belonging to one of the victims. When police told him that Neil was going to be implicated in the crimes, Shawcross then confessed to them. He gave excuses for killing the women and also admitted to two more undiscovered bodies, those of Maria Welsh and Darlene Trippy. During the trial, he was charged and found guilty of 10 instances of second-degree murder. The 11th victim was tried in a different county of which he was sentenced to life. 
For the 10 counts, Shawcross was sentenced to 25 years for each count, totaling 250 years of imprisonment. Shawcross was held in Sullivan Correctional Facility in New York State until November 10, 2008, when he died of cardiac arrest. Number 2. Leonardo Chianciulli Known as the soap maker of Correggio, Leonardo Chianciulli from Italy is one ruthless woman. Growing up in Montella di Avellino, Chianciulli had an unhappy childhood. She received little love from her mother because she was born as a result of a rape. As a young woman, she had her palm read and was told she would marry, but all of her children would die. When she got married, it was to a local registry clerk, but her parents strongly disapproved of the union. She believed that during their marriage, her mother cursed her and doomed her to a life of misery. A few years into her marriage, Canciuli's life did become problematic. She was imprisoned for fraud and her home was destroyed when an earthquake hit the area. What's more, despite getting pregnant 17 times, she lost 13 of her children through illness or miscarriage. Believing the curse was real, she sought the help of a local Romani fortune teller. But the teller had no good news for her. In fact, the woman told her, In your right hand I see prison, in your left a criminal asylum. Because of the unusual predictions and the curse she felt she was given, Kianciuli became extremely superstitious. This showed in how overprotective she was of her remaining four children. When her son Giuseppe said he wanted to join the Italian army in 1939, she feared for his life. To protect him from death while in the army, Canciuli decided a human sacrifice was needed. She chose a local spinster who had almost no family and invited her home under the guise of setting her up with a husband. Canciuli asked the woman to write letters to family members telling them she was moving abroad to visit the man. Afterward, she made the woman drink laced wine and murdered her with an axe. Then she cut her into pieces, put it into a pot, added caustic soda until everything dissolved before throwing everything in a septic tank. With the blood, she dried and used it to make crunchy tea cakes which she gave away to neighbors and also ate herself. You would think she would stop there, but she decided it wasn't enough and went after another victim, Francesca Soavi. Francesca also had little family in the area. This time, Canciuli promised to arrange a teaching job for her abroad. Like before, she drugged and killed her. She also baked some of her remains into tea cakes and took her savings money. Canciuli continued and found a third victim, and this time it was a noted soprano, Virginia Cassiopo, whom Canciuli promised to give a job to. Aside from turning her into tea cakes, Canciuli also melted her flesh and turned it into soap, giving them to neighbors and friends. But this third victim had a sister-in-law who lived nearby and who saw Virginia enter Canciuli's house before she disappeared. Police soon investigated the woman, but she denied the accusations. Authorities turned their sights on her son, Giuseppe, suspecting him openly. It was then that Canciuli finally gave in and admitted to the crimes. In the end, she was found guilty and sentenced to 33 years in prison. Like the Romani fortune teller's prophecy, she spent 30 years in prison and 3 years in an asylum. Canciuli died at the age of 79 in 1970 while inside the asylum due to a brain hemorrhage. Number 1. Rodney Acala Born as Rodrigo Bucor, his family was originally from San Antonio, Texas, before their father moved them to Mexico in 1951. But three years later, his father left his family, and his mother took him and his siblings to Los Angeles. At 17, he joined the U.S. Army, serving as a clerk, but was later discharged after a nervous breakdown. He had gone AWOL and hitchhiked his way home. He then went to UCLA School of Fine Arts after his discharge. His first known crime was in 1968 when he lured an eight-year-old girl, Tali Shapiro, into his Hollywood apartment. A motorist saw him and called police. Once authorities arrived at his apartment, they found the little girl alive, but she had been raped and beaten with a steel bar. Alcala, however, had already left. 
He was placed on the FBI's most wanted list for this crime. He escaped to New York and enrolled at NYU Film School where he studied under Roman Polanski. It's believed he used the pseudonym John Berger while enrolling. He also worked as a summer camp counselor. In June of 1971, TWA flight attendant, 23-year-old Cornelia Crilly was found dead inside her Manhattan apartment. She'd been raped and strangled. Her case went cold for decades until 2011 when Alcala was officially tied to the crime. When two children recognized his face on the FBI poster, Alcala was arrested and extradited to California. But since Shapiro's family would not let the girl testify, Alcala got a lesser charge and served only 34 months in prison. After he got out in 1974, he kidnapped another girl, Julie J., forced her to smoke pot and kissed her. He was arrested but was released after just two years. In 1977, while on parole, he went to New York and met and murdered socialite Ellen Hover. Hover's date book showed she was meeting John Berger. Alcala was questioned about the Hover case and denied it. Since no body was found, he was then let off the hook. In what will become one of the most unusual moves of Rodney Alcala's life, he joined the show The Dating Game in 1978. The show actually let him enter despite his criminal record and introduced him as a successful professional photographer. The Bachelorette picked Alcala in the end, but later refused to date him because she found him creepy. Alcala killed three more women within the next two years. His last known victim was 12-year-old Robin Samso. She was abducted while heading to a ballet class in Huntington Beach, and her body was found 12 days later in the Sierra Madres. Several witnesses came forward stating they saw a man matching Alcala's description attempting to get Sam So and a friend to wear swimsuits so he could take pictures of them. A forest ranger later testified seeing a man resembling Alcala leading a girl to a stream on June 20th. Days later, Alcala was arrested. During a home search, police found receipts to a storage locker in Seattle. When they searched it, they unearthed hundreds of photos of women and children some nude or dressed in swimwear. They also found Robin Samso's earrings and another pair belonging to another victim, Charlotte Lamb. Despite going to trial and being found guilty in 1980 for Samso's murder, the verdict was overturned twice. But as the third trial was prepared in 2003, DNA technology came into use and Alcala's DNA matched two other victims. By 2010, he was tried for five murders, Robin Samso, Georgia Wickstead, Charlotte Lamb, Jill Parento, and Jill Barcombe. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. In New York, he was indicted for the murders of Ellen Hover and Cornelia Crilly. He pled guilty to both of those and was given a life sentence. Many also believe he killed Pamela Lamson, who was 19 in 1977 in San Francisco, but he wasn't charged for lack of evidence. Police recently released 120 photos found in Alcala's locker, believing some of them might have been victims. They're appealing to the public to see if they recognize anyone in the images. So far, 21 women have come forward identifying themselves, while six families say the photos contain a missing family member. In 2016, Alcala was officially linked and charged with the murder of Christine Thornton, whose body was discovered in 1982 in Wyoming, five years after she was reported missing. One of her relatives had seen the photos and recognized her. Because of the number of possible victims, many believe Rodney Alcala might have killed around 130 victims and might have done so in many different states. So there were four horrific killers you've never heard about. While these people aren't household names, there's no denying these serial killers are as ruthless and unforgiving as those whose faces are etched permanently in the public's memory. We have new videos every Wednesday and Saturday, so if you enjoyed this one, then please subscribe and hit the notification bell. Thanks for tuning in this week, and we'll see you soon.